Good evening, you're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV, I'm Raymond Yeh. And I'm Harminder Singh. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Patient who was denied liver transplant previously finally gets operation. The Hang Seng Index posts biggest one-day percentage gain in nearly four years. And the United Nations calls for migrants to be treated humanely and without discrimination. Doctors have successfully performed a liver transplant on a patient who was denied an organ the first time last month when it was discovered that the donor had kidney cancer. The patient is now in critical but stable condition. Vicky Wen reports. The family of Stephen Lee was visiting him yesterday evening when they were suddenly informed of the good news by staff. Doctors performed the operation for about eight to nine hours after they received word that the donor liver was available. The donor organ is from a 54-year-old woman who died of a stroke at the Ellis Ho Mulling Nethiso Hospital in Taipo. Lee, who is 46, was already on the operating table on the 26th of August when his liver transplant procedure was suddenly halted after the surgeons were notified that the deceased donor had kidney cancer. Lee then fell into a coma because of a blood infection, and doctors warned that without a donor organ soon, he would not be able to survive for long. Doctors who performed the operation said today Lee is in critical but stable condition. Because he had uh, operations two weeks ago, and uh, at that time there was some bleeding after the, the uh, operation. There was some blood clot in the, uh, inside the, uh, the, in, in the abdomen. So there was actually a very limited space to put in the new liver. I think that is the main difficulty. But after, after the, other than that, uh, we have done half of the operation last time. So this time, uh, we basically just have to reconnect all the major vessels, and uh, that's pretty much about it. Earlier, surrounded by reporters at the hospital, Lee's wife, who had been appealing for a donor to come forward, expressed her gratitude. Some 3,000 patients in the city are waiting for organ transplants. Vicky Wen, ADV News. Local stocks rose sharply for a second day, with the benchmark index posting its biggest one-day percentage gain in nearly four years. The Hang Seng Index gained 872 points, or 4.1 percent, to close at 22,131. Turnover was $115 billion. Analysts said relatively low valuations are attracting bargain hunters, and investor sentiment was also boosted by signs that Beijing's efforts to stem further slides in mainland stocks may be paying off. Let's have a look at the European markets. The London FTSE is up 123 points, the Frankfurt DAX is up 173 points, and the Paris CAC is up 117 points. US dollar cross rates, the euro is 1.11, the pound sterling is 1.53, and it's 120.78 Japanese yen to the US dollar. To other news, Democratic Party Chairwoman Emily Lau has rejected allegations that her party has become intolerant to dissenting voices. This comes as a founding member handed in his resignation, citing differences between him and the party over democracy. Vicky Wen reports. The founding member of the Democratic Party, Tik Chi Yuan, has quit the party. Tik was one of the three pan-democrats who were invited to attend military parade last week in Beijing. In an open letter, Tik said external pressure has made it difficult for the party to accept alternative views, and he would seek other ways to achieve his goal for achieving democracy for Hong Kong. Tik had mentioned earlier that he was going to form a new group with Nelson Wong, who was expelled from the party in July for urging his former colleagues to pocket the political reform package. But Tik said the Democratic Party is still reliable, and there are chances for them to cooperate again in the future. However, the Democratic Party's chairwoman, Emily Lau, rejected accusations that the party is becoming less tolerant to different voices and is falling apart. I think that uh, the Democratic Party, uh, of course, we can make improvements, but I certainly think that we are uh, <laughs> very tolerant of dissenting views. But Mr. Tick is, of course, free and entitled to his opinion. I think we are very united. And those of us who are still in the party are very determined to pursue democracy in the way that we have decided. Meanwhile, civic party lawmaker Alan Leung, the convener of the so-called Pan-Democratic Party's meetings, that they are setting up platforms in the city's 18 districts to enhance communication ahead of the district council elections in November. 
They also said they will try their best to let other pan Democrats take her former colleague Ronnie Tong's seat in Legico after he leaves in October. Learn said they hope to have direct and regular communication with Beijing. Because only by doing so can we hope to ensure that Beijing would not misjudge about Hong Kong situation as a result of hearing only one side. The meeting ended with Le handing over the post of convener of the Pan Democratic Party's meetings, previously known as lunchbox meetings, to Labour Party's seat home. Vicky Wen, ATV News. Officials from Hong Kong and Guangdong province have signed a series of agreements after their annual meeting at government headquarters. But there was no mention of any timetable for the long-awaited Hong Kong Shenzhen Stock Connect program, which is expected to be rolled out this year. Guangdong Governor Zhu Xiaodan and Chief Executive Leung Chenying shook hands before kicking off the 18th plenary of the Hong Kong-Guangdong Cooperation Joint Conference at government headquarters. In his opening speech, Leung said Hong Kong has a significant role to play in Beijing's One Belt, One Road initiative, a development framework to build trade links between Europe and Asia. In exchange, a pilot free trade zone set up at the Pearl River Delta this year will provide a platform for the city services trade sector to tap into the mainland market. Zhu described both sides as good neighbors and brothers, adding Hong Kong's expertise in shipping, financial and trade industries will help Chinese enterprises reach out to the world. The two governments then signed cooperation agreements involving sister schools, food safety, electronic commerce, intellectual property rights and rescue coordination. After the meeting, Leung said it remains the goal of the SAL government to launch the Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Trading Link as soon as possible, but stopped short of giving a specific timetable. For his part, Zhu said both sides have proposed to boost ties on areas such as youth development, infrastructure and the environment, all of which were agreed upon. The annual meeting, which began in 1998, is aimed at forging better communication between the SAL and Guangdong, which accounted for 10.7% of the country's GDP in 2014, topping all provinces. The district court has sentenced five mainlanders and a Taiwanese man to between 16 months and two years in jail for a cross-border telephone scam. The court heard that the scammers, pretending to be nurses or police officers, called three Taiwanese women, including a retired professor, asking them for money. The women then deposited a total of $2.5 million into the accounts given to them by the defendants. The six had earlier pleaded guilty to money laundering charges. Hong Kong has recently been hit by a wave of phone scams, with some losing millions of dollars at one go. The Education Bureau says it will wait for a report on lead in water before deciding if water safety tests should cover all schools across the city. But first in our roundup of local news, New People's Party Deputy Chairman Michael Tian has revealed details of a private meeting with a top mainland official in Beijing last week. Karin Yang reports. <laughs> The new People's Party deputy chairman and lawmaker Michael Tian told a radio program this morning that he had a private meeting with a Beijing leader during his visit to the capital for the war commemoration parade last week. Tian revealed that they discussed the possibility of initiating another round of political reform for the SAR during the next government term. Tian said he thinks the central authorities will only restart it if they have confidence the package will be passed in Lechko, adding that it will be humiliating for Beijing if such proposal gets voted down again. Tian said if more pan-democrats who are willing to communicate with the central government get elected to the legislature, the more likely political reform will be discussed. Over 300 teaching staff from primary and secondary schools across the city have attended the Education Bureau's talk on the lead in water issue. The Bureau earlier said they will perform water safety tests for government-built schools completed from 2005. As for the schools built before 2005, the Bureau said they will decide if tests are also necessary after looking at the Cross-Departmental Task Force's report on lead contamination in water supplies. The report is due to be released by the end of this month. The Bureau's principal education officer, Lee Kam Kwang, said for the time being, they will give the schools a list of recommended water filters to choose from, and the schools can claim the expenses from the existing government funding. 
To mark World Suicide Prevention Day tomorrow, the Hong Kong Jockey Club Center for Suicide Research and Prevention has released the latest figures and prevention recommendations. The center's director, Paul Yip, said the rate has been dropping since 2003, but added there were still about 12.3 out of every 100,000 people who chose to end their lives last year. The center also surveyed over 1,000 young people aged 12 to 29 in 2013. More than 300 said they had experienced continuous emotional distress in the past four weeks, while 30 percent in this group didn't seek help. However, 70 percent of them had expressed their feelings on online platforms. The center said this shows the Internet is a new mode of outreach for young people in distress. Karen Yang, ATV News. Turning overseas, the United Nations has called on European nations to treat migrants humanely and without discrimination. It says most of them are, feeling, uh, are fleeing violence and persecution in their home countries and have the right to seek asylum. As the United Nations made the appeal, a second ship crammed with nearly 1,500 refugees, mainly Syrians, from Lesbos Island in Greece, docked at Piraeus port. The Greek authorities are stepping up efforts to ferry migrants from the island to the mainland so that they can continue their journey to other European countries. There are some 15,000 to 18,000 refugees on the island with inadequate supply of food and water. The United Nations has made an urgent appeal to other European countries to do their bit. The Secretary General stressed the individual and collective responsibility of European states to respond, uh, to respond responsibly and humanely. He stressed that the large majority of people arriving in Europe are refugees fleeing the war and violence who have a right to seek asylum without any form of discrimination. The head of the UN's refugee agency warned the number of refugees would increase if worldwide conflicts can't be prevented and stopped. There are no reasons to be optimistic about uh, uh, forced displacement in the world. Uh, the Syria crisis is not the only one. It is, of course, the biggest one and the one that is closer to the European borders. But the, 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 either the world increases its capacity to uh, improve uh, prevention and to more effectively solve conflicts, or I think that uh, uh, the refugee problem is going to go on increasing in the years to come. The UN says at least 850,000 people are expected to cross the Mediterranean seeking refuge in Europe this year and next. In relation to the migrant crisis, there have been criticisms of wealthy Muslim nations not taking in any of the refugees. A British Airways flight caught fire as it was preparing to take off from Las Vegas airport. But first, Thai police have brought the second arrested suspect near the site of the bomb attack that killed 20 people, including from Hong Kong, three weeks ago. The second suspect who was arrested near the Thai-Cambodian border with a Chinese passport earlier this month was brought back to areas near the Erawan Shrine, the scene of the deadly bombing. The suspect, Yusufu Mir Ali, was taken to perform a reconstruction of the moments before and after the blast. Mir Ali had allegedly told police that he had traveled to Hua Lamphong Station in Bangkok from an apartment in the outskirts of the capital where police had found bomb-making materials in an earlier raid. The police said the man had confessed to being part of a network and to being in the area of the bombing, but did not elaborate. The police believe the actual bomber is the yellow-shirted man caught by a surveillance camera and is still at large. A British Airways jetliner caught fire in Las Vegas, Nevada as the plane was about to take off. The flight was bound for London before pilots aborted takeoff. After taxiing a few minutes on the runway, the aircraft was preparing to take off on runway 7 left at McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas. The aircraft, a Boeing 777-200, experienced a fire in its left side engine as it was preparing to take off. Firefighters who arrived at the scene were able to quickly extinguish the fire. The Boeing 777 was carrying 172 passengers and crew and were able to exit the plane via emergency slides before flames and smoke engulfed the plane. Two people suffered minor injuries and were taken to hospital. 
Queen Elizabeth II celebrated 63 years on the throne today, surpassing the reign of her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. Queen Elizabeth was coronated in 1952 after the death of her father, King George VI. The special occasion has tourists and media flocking to Britain to cover the event. This event, Queen Elizabeth II becoming Britain's longest ever reigning monarch, has garnered so much press attention and so much public interest. I think it's a real marker of the popularity of the Queen as an individual, but also the popularity of the royal family. And it's quite an incredible thing that so many people have, um, have shown a huge interest in this, um, in this amazing day. However, not everybody is celebrating the milestone. I don't think we should be paying so much lip service to um, uh, an inherited um, wealth. Having Queen Elizabeth as the reigning monarch is apparently also best for business. If you look at it as a business, you have to think about succession planning and whether um, Prince Charles will prove as successful a CEO, as it were, as uh, Elizabeth has. Um, he's not as universally well-liked as Elizabeth is. Royal assets are said to be worth £22.8 billion, putting the monarchy in the top 20 global rich list, while Queen Elizabeth herself is also the largest landowner in the world.